All right, let's get started. Shh. All right, everyone, let's get started. Uh, can we start? Thank you, it's two. All right, um, questions before we get started. Questions before we get started, anything in your mind? All right, I know this is obvious, but I want you all to keep in mind, we're now at class 20 which basically means that we are two thirds of the way through the semester. Um, it doesn't get easier from here, right? It gets harder uh, because everything becomes iterative. You have to remember all the things we've learned and also all the things we're going to learn, right? You have all the Fox stuff, Right, you have all the future interest stuff. You have joint tenancies. You have now marital property. We'll finish up with leaseholds and landlord tenant law. There's a wide range of material on a really wide range of topics. And you're responsible for all of it. Um, by this point, you should be taking the old midterms and sort of assessing yourself. I think in a week or two, week or so, you can start taking the old finals and really see where you are. Um, you know, this is one of these classes where I'm not hiding any ball. There's no balls being hit. Um, you know, everything, everything that, you know, you need to survive is given to you. Um, what usually distinguishes the A's from the B students is how much you avail yourself, how much you use those resources. Right, I can't force you to do stuff that uh, would be probably illegal, um, I think at least, but uh, I can give it to you and, and expect you to complete it. Okay. All right. Um, so let's review a little bit uh, what we covered last two classes. Um, we did the topic of concurrent interests. And with concurrent interests, we had a couple different kinds. We had the tenancy in common, uh, the joint tenancy, and then the tenancy by the entirety. And the biggest differences between those concurrent interests concerned what happens in case of death and what happens in case of a conveyance, right? With the tenancy in common, there's really nothing restricting one co-tenant from doing whatever he wants. He can sell it. It won't matter. When one tenant dies, it goes to the tenant's heirs. There's no survivorship. But the joint tenancy, uh, sorry, the, the joint tenancy has more integration between the two partners, right? There's a right of survivorship. If one partner dies, the other one gets it. But if there's a conveyance, they break up that tenancy and they get rid of the unities and they don't have survivorship rights. And then we got to the last one, the third one. That was kind of weird. Right, it was the tenancy by the entirety. And with the tenancy by the entirety, it's custom made for married couples, right? It has the right of survivorship, but it also has another feature that's very significant, right? So look at question number one on the board. Who, who's next? Where am I up to? Okay, uh, Jocelyn, thank you. So look at question number one, please. The question is this. Husband and wife own Blackacre as tenants by the entirety. The husband executes the following conveyance. Blackacre from husband to A and his heirs. Is this conveyance valid, Jocelyn? Why not?
without what happening? Well, or divorce, or what's short of divorce? What can the husband and wife agree to do? Well, you can't do that either. How do you break up? Short of divorce, how can you break up a tenancy by the entirety? What could both spouses do? Are husband and wife bound to the same house forever? They can't leave? They can't move? So what, what, what can they do? And how would they do that? And how would they do that? You're, you're thinking way too hard. So husband and wife live in a house, right? They want to move. What do they have to do? What? And how do they sell the house? There's a really easy way. It happens all the time, every day. And how do they sell it without violating the rule you just announced? You're ever thinking you're going to hate yourself after 15 seconds. They do it together. They jointly agree to sell it together, right? If the husband and wife agree that they want to convey the marital property, they can do that, right? There's nothing wrong with that. You can always have two spouses agree to convey the property together, right? The challenge, though, right? The challenge, though, becomes what if they don't agree? Or what if one of the spouses doesn't get the other spouse's consent? So we saw a little bit of this in the Schwarzbach case last week, right? Where one husband wants to put a boxing ring in, his, in the property, and otherwise said, absolutely not. And the husband did it anyway. He leased the property. And then the California court said that that lease was not sufficient to terminate the unities. So as a result, the property remained a joint tenancy, and the husband kept the survivorship rights, which is very valuable. Right? But I want to take a step back. Uh, Tony, let me ask you this question. You're next, right? Yeah. Let me ask you this question, please. Why do you think the law developed with this tenancy by the entirety, such that both spouses had to consent, that one spouse couldn't make a transaction with the other spouse? Why? Why do you think this this regime developed over the centuries and it's hundreds of years we're talking about? Uh, I don't know. Long before that. Long before that. Why, why, why do you think the law developed to make it harder to break up a tenancy by the entirety? Why is marriage special? Why do they create this special estate for married couples? That's my question. Marriage, right? Why is marriage special? I don't know if I will. And this was a mistake. <laughs> yeah, this is a yeah, good question. Um, yeah. <laughs> You're really thinking here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's the concept of ownership and who can their ownership interest. But why why is it something important to protect? History does play a role here. So that they can't be deprived of who can't be deprived? Don't, don't say they. Who? Who are we talking about? Husband and wife of their home of their homestead or their property. Wow. But but my question specifically, why did it make why did the law make it tough for one spouse to convey without the other one's consent? Because then one partner could completely screw the interest. Screw, okay. Uh, harm or, or injure. How about that? About that? We'll use legal, legal, legal words, right? Okay. Riga, you want to take a stab? Uh, yeah, I think it has to do with kind of like primogeniture in that you want to align a succession and you don't want two sides of the family fighting over the same piece. Of oh, that, that's creative. Well, Riga, let me ask you this follow-up question. At common law, did women have much of a right to convey property on their own? Yeah, they did not. So let me ask this question. Of why didn't the law develop to protect this tenancy by the entire actually your screw point was actually uh, very close to this right why why did the law develop to protect this tenancy by the entirety that that both spouses had to sort of make the transaction what could have happened otherwise um, if you don't have the consent of both parties you could like end up with maybe a wife who can't support herself kind of being kicked to the curb i think that's right chris you want to add anything to that what do you think why did this estate develop the way it did over the course of hundreds of years? I would say to preserve the family unit, but I don't know if I... That's 
not wrong. I mean, that was a question I put to Tony before. I think I had trouble with, right? Why is marriage special? I'll go back to that question. To preserve the family unit. Why, 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 why is that important to preserve the family unit? Um, I would think that, well, I would think that you don't have a lot of divorce, but... Was divorce even legal back then? And not for women, but men could. That's exactly right. All right, I think, I think we're getting there. Anwar, anything you want to add to this? No, I can't say maybe public policy. Uh, Give me more. What do you mean public policy? I think you're 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 on a, you're on a track. I know which track you're on. Um, you kind of want society to act in a certain manner. Ah, okay. So what manner were they trying to act? Uh, were they trying to get society to act in? I guess both citizens. What? Um, both parties be civil and be viewed as equal. Okay, fascinating. Okay, I think I think I think I think we got more or less everything I want to hit. Right. So we're starting this new unit today, right, of marital property, and you know I think today where a lot of us are cynical. Right, almost all people get married, but half people will probably get divorced. Right, it's true. Actually, for lawyers, it's probably less than half because for among people with professional degrees, the number is a little bit less. Uh, but a plurality of you will get married, and part of that will get divorced. Right, and we have kind of cynical about marriage, but for <laughs> but for millennia, marriage was pretty important. And and I, I make this point in con law, and people don't understand it, but marriage existed to foster procreation. That was it. Right, I mean, it wasn't about love. <laughs> It was about to ensure that people who would give birth to children would be raising kids in a, in a stable fashion. I mean, that, that's why marriage existed in every civilization ever, right? That, that's why it developed. In fact, polygamy was somewhat <laughs> preferred because if you have more people in this family, you actually have more people to help uh, uh, develop the family, right? And this is not accepted today, of course, but this was historically the reason. But with marriage came burdens. And for the longest of time, until fairly recently in world history, women had zero rights. That upon a woman getting married in, in, in the world, she basically surrendered her ability to manage her affairs to her husband. Okay, and this is not, you know, the, the, this is fact. This is, this, is, this is pretty well established in history. Um, but the property law developed to create what we might call um, a legal fiction. All right, you may, maybe you heard this phrase before. Mike, you know what a legal fiction is? You've heard this phrase before? Uh, Chris, I'll come back to you in a second. Do you, do you know what legal fiction is? Uh, isn't it just kind of like a term of art? Like it's something that they come up with that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're the right. I'll come back to you, Mike. Right, so legal fiction is like something you make up to make a bad thing sound not so bad. I, I'm, I'm always... You can look at Black's Dictionary. I'm sure that Brian Garner has a better definition than I do. Right, but it's something you make up to cover over something that's bad and make it look cool. Right, make it look proper. And, and in some measure, that's how marital property develops, right? As a realistic matter, for the longest of time, for millennia, women had no rights to marriage, right? If they were married, they got no rights. But the law created this sort of fiction that there was this partnership. Would you say two becoming one or something? Like that? Yeah, where there's this partnership or two becoming one. And that sounds great until you realize that the two becomes one, sure, but the husband controlled the two, right? He had full... He was with, with, The term was actually the manager. That was actually the term you would use. He would manage the affairs of both both parties. And any property you want to acquire, any property you want to sell, he could basically use unilaterally. That's not the law anymore, right? The law we have now is different over the last 170 years or so. But that's how the law developed forever. Okay? Everyone with me? All right. So throughout history, two primary systems of marital property developed. We'll cover one of them today, and we'll cover the other one next week, okay? The one we'll cover next week is called community property, sometimes called the continental breakfast. No, the continental system. And why is it called the continental system? It came from the European continent, right? Spain, France, Portugal, the, the countries on the continent. The other one came from England. We'll get there in a few minutes, right? Um, with the community, uh, uh, sorry, the continental system, the community property system, the husband and wife, when they're married, are merged into a partnership. It's almost like forming a corporation, right? If you have a people come together, you know, you know, they form a company. And, and, and basically, the company is its own entity. It's a legal fiction, to use the word I gave a minute ago. Um, whatever one spouse earns is deemed owned by both spouses. That's a significant concept, in theory at least. Didn't always work out so great. Um, 
And if there's actually a divorce, you would actually divide up the community property so the wife would not get nothing. She would get something. Of course, I think Chris said this a few minutes ago. Uh, at common law, only the husband could petition for divorce. There were some exceptions for abuse if it was a really egregious case, but it's a general matter. Only the husband could petition, and adultery too, but generally the husband could only petition for divorce. So divorce settlements were rare. But at least if there was a divorce, the wife would be entitled to um, a share of the community property they had together. All right. We will cover the community property system uh, next week, so the next two classes. Uh, indeed, Texas, as we'll see, has it. So pay close attention because a lot of you will get married. A lot of you will get unmarried, as they say. I, I hate to be f cynical, but I went to law school, too. And just a lot of you come here married and leave unmarried. And a lot of you come unmarried and leave married and get unmarried later. So it just it, it happens. And look, look, it's true. I, 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 I'm teaching up for 10 years. I see it. It happens. I, to, to close, right? But it, it's true. Wait till we get to next week's class when one spouse puts the other spouse through law school. That'll be a fun class. That that that, that would always make people very uncomfortable. <laughs> I, I I hate I hate I hate this topic. I hate this topic because I know who you all are. And anyway, so it it, it happens every week. <laughs> Look, it happens. It happens. Okay. It's actually an easier class for the night students because they're putting themselves through school. Okay, I'm gonna stop. It's okay. So yeah, this was it's true. All right, that's. That's the community property system. Just just read the In Ray Graham case for next week, and then we'll see who everyone falls. It's about a a flight attendant wife who puts her business school her her husband through business school, and then as soon as he gets his business degree, he dumps her and divorces her. And then the wife wants to treat the business degree as a marital asset to divide up, meaning his future income from the business degree that she basically put him through working all these hours flying around the country. And you'll see what the court does. But anyway, that's the community property system. The other system is called the English system, or I'll put in parentheses like this. It's called the common law property or the English system. Now, I, English system is probably a better phrase because it says it comes from England. But in most books and cases you read, right, it's called the common law system. Now, this label confuses students to no end. Why? Usually when you say common law, you think, okay, there's the modern rule and there's a common law, right? You've done this 100 times in torts and contracts. Not here. Common law in this context does not refer to a time period. Common law refers to England. This was a common law in England. What will drive you mad is that in some states that are common law property systems, they follow a modern rule. And you ready for this? Like New York and New Jersey follow modern common law rules. And Texas, ready for this, will follow a common law, common law rule. Did I just break your brains? Yeah, I'm sorry. I know it happens every year, right? So when you use the word common law in the context of marital property, just in your head, substitute English, right? It'll make it easier. But be aware that within common law states, right, there's some that follow modern trends about division of assets and otherwise and other common law states that follow what you might call the common law approach, which is how it was done in England. So you, again, it's going to break your brain. And, and I, I'm going to tell, I'm, I'm warning you, on the exam, I will trick you in the following way. It won't matter. I can give you this warning all day long. I heard you guys talking about the CIPRO exam. I'm telling you, I'm going to ask you. There's no, there's no secrets in my class, yeah. right? I'll tell you a funny story. When I was in ninth grade, my English teacher for uh, an assignment asked us to actually write exams, right? To actually write an exam. And she actually used mine. They were so mad at me. They want because I wrote a really hard one. They were so mad at me that they like it was the hardest exam in the world. That was me, right? But anyway, so <laughs> I, I feel you, right? But anyway, I'm telling you what I'm going to do in the exam. On the instructions, I'm going to say this is a common law jurisdiction for marital property, or it's a community property with common law rules, right? I may mix up the instructions. You have to pay very close attention to what I say. Is this going to be a traditional community property state or a modern? Like California's community property, it's all modern stuff. But Texas community property, it's all common law. Right. So it's going to hurt your brains. So pay very close attention to what the jurisdiction is. This will make more sense when we actually go through some of the distinctions between common law and marital. But one of the biggest reasons why you guys lose points on the marital property question is so you do it the wrong jurisdiction. Right. You apply the wrong jurisdiction, you apply the wrong rules, and then you get the question wrong. So I've warned you. Fair?
Read the instructions, especially if the marital property collection real close. Yeah, Anwar, I see your hands up. Uh, in the book, it calls it separate property systems. Should we, should we oh, God, you want another label? I mean, look, yeah. I, I, you're not wrong. You're right. I, I just want to give you a third label, right? I, I go with common law or English, or I'll say um, community or continental. That, that's what I say. If you want to do the other one, good, but I don't want to give you like a third label because it just gets your your head will break. Yeah, this this topic is messy because the, the labels do confuse students. Okay. Oh yeah, Gabriel, or, or was it Gabriel? Gabriel, I'm sorry. So you told me and I, I forgot. Gabriel. Well, this is a low chair. You should hire. It's oh, it's, it's who did that? <laughs> who did that? That's my thing. Okay, go on, Gabriel. Go ask your question. I'm, I'm sitting. Just to confirm, this distinction generally, like you said, common law refers back to England in the time period. Correct. But only in marital property law are we making this. Law. Yeah, right. So I, so again, if you look at my old exams, I might tell you that the state has a common law property system, but a community law marital property system. And if you don't read that sentence correctly, you get it wrong, right? Again, just look at my old exams. Do nothing else. So look at the instructions, the first paragraph on each page, right? I can tell you it's a common law property system with a community property marital system. And like half the class people just lose that and do the wrong thing. So again, I'm fair notice. Like I'm not, there's no ball hiding. I'm giving you everything you need. Just don't do it, right? Just don't, 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 don't fall into the trap. All right. I don't need to trick you because it's so easy to not. Like it, 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 there's, there's no reason to like try and deceive you. It's all there. Okay. All right. So let's do, we did the um, the community system. Let's do the English system, the common law. Right. In the English system, in theory at least, the husband and the wife have separate property. And I said in theory, so just listen to what I said. In theory, at least, they have separate property. If the husband acquires property during the marriage belongs to the husband. If the wife acquires property during the marriage, it belongs to the wife. Upon divorce, the husband keeps his stuff and the wife keeps her stuff. All right. And you may think, oh, wow, Josh, that seems fair, right? Everyone keeps their own stuff. But again, go back to what happened in England. Wife didn't have any property. Husband had the full salary. So whatever the husband earned, he could actually keep it from the wife. So in some regards, the community system in France and Spain ensured that the divorced wife got something. She didn't walk away with nothing for the marriage. The English system, in theory at least, could leave the wife destitute, as someone said, to kick down the curve, right? So what makes, again, one second, Trey, what makes this topic trickier is that the common law judges develop tools to prevent the wife from being poor. So alimony, right? A monthly payment. That it, it's now called spousal support. It's not called it, the alimony was considered, I guess, sexist. But now it's called alimony, uh, spousal support because it goes either way. A husband can support or a wife. It's not just one one spouse, right? Alimony can be provided. There's also other ways that a wife whose husband dies can get something. So imagine your husband in a in a common law state, and you write your wife every will. You give her nothing in her will, and then she thinks she's getting half, and then she dies, and she gets nothing. So actually, we'll look, study this, I think, next class. The wife can opt out of the will and request a share of the husband's property. So even though, in theory at least, in, in a common law state, there's this division of husband and wife, both at divorce and death, those two important junctures, divorce and death, the surviving spouse or the uh, divorced spouse can get a cut of the husband's separate property. The rules here are tricky. We'll do this a little bit more next class, but once you understand that. Trey, were you going to ask about alimony? Uh, inheritance is different, right? In either system, right? If a wife or husband inherits property, that's their separate property. Inheritance is like the actually outlier. Inherited property is considered separate. So let's say while you're married, you inherit Blackacre from your you know, your great grandfather. Upon divorce, Blackacre is yours. You don't have to split it. Okay, make sense? Yes, Clark. Uh, how does the uh, how does it work so that can like uh, custody of like kids? Okay, we're not going to do kids in this class, and I'm going to tell you why. It's not. It's not a pro kids are not property, right? But I, I don't. But 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 it's not a trivial thing because in a divorce, until the custody issues are decided, the court can't finalize division of assets because often the way you allocate custody is depending on who has money for what. X amount dollars of child support, etc. So the 
the finalization of a divorce and the allocation of property, division of assets, is often contingent upon reaching a separation for the kids and, and child support. Um, you'll take family law later in law school. And I got to tell you, my friends, that's a hard class. Anyone ever do family law at any point? Uh, it's tough, right? Because you see people at their absolute worst, right? They're just broken. Their family is destroyed. And, and they, they have, it's, 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 it's very, it's, it's, this is why I speak from experience because I've seen it, right? It's tough. So if you want to, if you have a stomach for family law, it's meaningful work because you're helping people and they're really needing it. But I got to tell you, it gets ugly because when people feel like cornered and threatened, they start punching dirty and they start, right? Right, Victoria? They start playing dirty with kids. Yeah. And they, they, they dangle their kids to try and get more money. Yeah, it happens. I'm, I'm, I'm not making this up. This is, this is what happens. So I, Clark, I'm deliberately not answering your question about children, but, but you'll take family law maybe next year, the year after. Um, not, it's not in the bar, which is just insane because it's the most important type of law people actually have to know. But you should, I would recommend you guys take family law at some point while you're graduate. We have Professor George is the, one of the experts in the state on that topic. Is that a hand there? Oh, yeah, Gabriel. The chair's here. In theory, at least, yeah. In theory, she retains her property as well. The property she acquires during the marriage, correct. And the property she had before the marriage. Well, the, the reason why I keep saying in theory, I keep sort of like hedging, is that common law back in England, the wife couldn't really acquire property. Who was going to sell it to her? She couldn't form a contract, right? The wife lacked legal capacity to work. She couldn't form a contract. She couldn't twiggle with the, with the liver of season, right? She couldn't commit. I'm being serious. She couldn't do these things. So there was no property to give her. The only property she may have had was just random gifts her husband gave her, right? Clothes and paraphernalia, they call it just random household you know, goods. But, but generally, because a woman couldn't contract and do various things, there was nothing in her name, right? If, she, if her husband divorced her, there was nothing for her name. So the only thing she'll get would be the alimony or some other, other division of assets. Okay, so when you're referring to that, you're, you're looking a little bit. Well, okay, so I have a doubt. You said if the wife acquires property in the marriage, if, her, right, if, if okay. but, but there's not much required. Inheritance, what Trey mentioned a minute ago, that's one of the rare things that she actually would acquire separately, right? Inheritance is. Again, I mean, I don't want to make this point belabored, but like, in order to convey property, you have to make a contract. They couldn't sign their name on a dotted line. They were not allowed to by law. So there really was nothing for them to acquire. Yeah, Andres? Uh, I was wondering about salaries. Uh, we'll get to that later. That's in the reading, I think, for next class week, the one after. Okay, Tony, last question, move on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, real quick, with the <laughs> white box, clarify with the uh, will. Can... We'll do that next class. We're, we're not doing that. We're, we're doing. We're doing. Not death today. We'll do death with the spouse next week. It's different rules. All right. So everyone get the general broad strokes, the difference between community property and common law property. Right? These are distinct concepts. Okay. As a practical matter today, there's not huge differences, right? If you're in one state or the other, most married couples never even know the difference until they get divorced. Uh, in your day-to-day -day life, it makes almost no difference which system you're in, right? Because courts don't say, oh, well, spouse A, I think of spouse B, you know, a new car. They don't get involved unless there's abuse, some other allegations. Where marital property matters is at divorce and upon death. Those are the two points of time where it really matters, right? Because if you're in Texas and you get divorced, all of your property is considered community property unless you do really a lot of work to separate it. And it's very hard to do that. If you're in New York or New Jersey, which are common law states, you can skate by. If husband, his bank account, wife, that's her bank account, they keep their own stuff. Even in Texas, if you have separate bank accounts, it's not enough. It's considered community property. Um, if you move from New York to Texas, good luck. The rules just got really complicated. If you move from Texas to New York, the rules are even more complicated. We'll do the migrating couple example, I think, next week. All right. So today, and I think it's 42 states they follow the common law, uh, common law property regime. In eight states that are influenced by France and Spain, mostly in the Southwest, but granted in other ones, they follow community property. So it's Arizona, California, Louisiana, Nevada, New Mexico, and Texas, right? Those make sense. Idaho and Washington, I have no idea. I don't know why, but, but they're in the list also. But Texas, where you all, I think, I think you all live in Texas, right? I've never heard a student from outside of Texas, but maybe I have, I don't know. But, but I think you all live in Texas, so you would be subject to this if you were to be married here. 
Um, but again, the rules, you don't notice the difference until you get divorced, right? It, it really makes no difference during, during the marriage. It's only upon divorce you, you notice it. And when, if you're dead, then you're dead. But if your spouse dies, then it also makes a difference. This class is so depressing. The Fox cases seem fun, right, by comparison? It's true. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. So let's go back to the any questions so far. You guys asked more questions in my morning section. I got, like this morning, I finished like at nine and like, at ten. I'm like, nothing left. Okay, go on. We'll, we'll, we'll go to the end today. Yeah. So the complication of like moving to a different state is this because like different rules apply depending? Property on doesn't where? move, my friend. So if you own Blackacre in New York, the New York law still control it, but you're living okay, in Texas. So that's the problem. It doesn't have anything to do with where you were married, right? Or does that factor in? It might because. If it's personal property, let's say you buy a horse or something, and a horse can, in theory, see the flamingo that went from Kansas to Texas? You see that? Isn't that cool? A flamingo 17 years ago, like it's like from, you know, it flew from Kansas all the way down to Texas and living in the wild. A flamingo. They found it in Houston. So, like, I don't know, if you bring a flamingo from another state, then it matters actually where you got married because you, you often title the property based on where your marriage was at the time. So, so the location of marriage may matter. You know what's all this? You guys are. Is there such a cool story? It's like from Pixar or something, right? You know, it's, it's a. Anyway, a flamingo. Jason. Shh. Oh, please don't give me fractions. Right. And the reason why I don't want you to give me fractions, and this actually is a good segue, they put it together. What, Pierre, what's the French word I asked you about last week and I couldn't remember? Format et toi. I can't remember. What was it? It's fine. You know what I mean. I can't pronounce it, so it's not in the exam, right? But there's this French concept that they own it all together. There are no separate shares, right? Now, why is that important? With a joint tenancy, we say that they're separate but undivided shares, right? With a tenancy by the entirety, they're separate but undivided shares. In a community property state, a married couple can't have separate anything. In Texas, a married couple can't have separate anything. Therefore, they can't have a tenancy by the entirety. I, I'm going to say that again. I know that confused a lot of you. The entire point of a joint tenancy and a tenancy by the entirety is that they're separate shares. Husband has a sh partner, you know, tenant A has a share, tenant B has a share. But in Texas, you can't have that. Right? There are no separate shares. You own everything together, not 50 50, 100%. So in Texas, the rules for married couples are different. There's not. There's technically a tenancy by the entirety, but it, don't worry about it. It doesn't really exist. But in Texas, if you're married and you create a joint tenancy, the rules are different. We'll cover this next week, right? It's not just the four years. It gets more messy, All right? So I think you can actually make this note in your, in your class notes. All the stuff we've been talking about for joint tenancy so far is in common law states, right? The rules for a common law, I'm sorry, a community state joint tenancy are different. And again, I'm, I'm not going to deceive you on the exam. I'm going to ask you probably about the rules for a joint tenancy, and it might be in a, a community property state, and the rules are different. I might ask you about a piece of property that moves from New York to Texas as a joint tenancy. I've done this before. I'm not, I'm not tricking you. It's all there on my, my record. All right. Or the flamingo flies, right? I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'll have a question, though. You're, you're chasing a flamingo instead of a fox, and it becomes you know, like I get creative. All right. Everyone with us? Yeah. Um, no, and I don't want to. I don't want to answer that question today. We'll do it next week. All right. Uh, let's see. Did I miss anything? All right. So again, a few points. I think I skipped over. Um, at common law, the husband was basically the manager of the system. He was literally called the manager. Uh, it's almost like a bizarre term, but that's what he was called. And you have this doctrine called coverture. C O V E R coverture. T U R E coverture. What is coverture? Literally, the husband would cover the wife. That's what it meant legally. He would handle over transactions. He would engage in all of her business. Even if she had separate property, the husband would decide whether to sell it or not. She couldn't veto the sale, right? And this system developed to basically make the woman insubordinate, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 unequal in every, every sense of the word, right? She couldn't even control her own stuff. Um, it was a, it was a fiction that there were this union, but really it was a husband in charge. That, that was the way it was for many years. Okay. This system started to change in the 1800s. Let's transition to the next topic. And it started to transition not entirely because of people saying, wow, this is unfair to women, 
it's hard to transition as a way to protect families from creditors. Now, I'm just going to give you some background on credit law. I assume you know nothing about this, which is fine. If you're all young. Maybe you don't have credit card bills. But generally, if you have debt, a mortgage, a credit card bill, a car loan, a gambling debt, right? Whatever it happens to be, people aren't giving you money because they like you. They're giving you money because they think they can collect it from you if you don't pay up with interest, right? So generally, if you want to get a loan, you have to what's called collateral, right? You have to have something that if you don't pay up, they seize your property. Or maybe they can garnish your wages if you've heard of that revenue. They basically take money off your paycheck. The bottom line is creditors get paid. They'll find a way to get the money from you. It might take them a couple of years, but they'll find it. Or they'll take it from your co-signer, right? With student loans, they go after your folks. Okay. At common law, the husband was in charge, right? The husband could control everything. If the husband could control everything, the creditors could seize whatever the husband controls. Right? That's the rule. Whatever you can control, you can seize. So because the husband controlled all marital assets, guess what? The creditors can seize all the marital assets they can right the creditors can seize all the marital assets the wife had no veto over this so let's say the husband ran up a gambling debt and they own black acre right it's tense by the entirety guess what the bookie can go and take the house gambling sorry it's kind of illegal but you know i'm getting it right they find a way to seize it, right? Let's say it's a, it's, a, it's a business debt or a business loan debt they default on. They come and take the house. The wife didn't accept that debt. She's like the woman in California who didn't want the boxing ring, right? But she still loses her house. So in the 1830s, states began to say, wait a minute. How can we prevent this from happening, right? How can we create a system in which the spouse who's not responsible for the debt isn't getting, use so many words, screwed, right? How can we create a system to protect the spouse? And a number of states, starting with Mississippi of all places, uh, again, this was not about women's rights. It was about presenting debting husbands. Just let's be, just be candid here for a few minutes. Mississippi enacted in 1839 something called the Married Women's Property Act. The Married Women's Property Act. Okay, what was the Married Women's Property Act? This was a law. That gave a woman one, or at least one, very important right. She could refuse to sell her homestead, her tenancy by the entirety. Mm. Right? She could refuse to sell her homestead, her, her tenancy by the entirety. She couldn't manage it. She couldn't sell it on her own. Right? But she could block the sale. That is poll question number one we did earlier. I think Jocelyn had a few minutes ago. Right? The reason why this question comes out the way it does is because of the Married Women's Property Act, which now exists in all the states. The woman, the, and I, I hate to be sexist, but it was always the wife, right? This is how it was back then, right? The wife could block the sale of the property. In theory, it was both, but, but that didn't matter. The wife could block the sale. As a consequence of this, creditors could no longer reach the tenancy by the entirety For the husband's separate debts, or at least most states reach that. We'll talk about the split in a few minutes, right? But a number of states said, aha, the woman can control it. Therefore, this is not entirely the husband's assets. It's a, it's a unified, you know, a, a unit. And the creditors, the bank cannot go after the tenancy by the entirety. This was designed, again, to shield the spouse from uh, creditors. Okay? Uh, so that's 1839 in Mississippi. A couple years later, it was 1840, actually one year later, 1840, uh, the Republic of Texas. By the way, I, you, I'm sure you all, I didn't go to high school here. I'm a carpetbagger, right? But, but I'm sure you all took Texas history. I am. I went to law school in Virginia. A teacher said, you're a carpetbagger. And I was like, Virginia? I'm going to Texas, right? Uh, if if you gone with the wind, it would have been canceled. Yeah, it's carpetbagger. The, the people who came from up north and were basically selling goods out of a, their, their, their bags, which may have carpet, and they were considered like taking advantage of the South. Anyway, uh, it's, it's a movie. Um, under the Republic of Texas, the state enacted a Married Women's Property Act, which was actually one of the most advanced in the country. A woman could enter into some contracts, they could write wills, and they could sue for divorce. That was groundbreaking because now the wife could also petition for divorce, not just the husband. And the wife could veto the sale of property and veto the sale of the homestead, which was even more important. 
the husband couldn't go on his own and sell the property without her consent. Now, again, it was there pressure? Was it was wife actually consenting? Proof questions, right? But at least in paper, this was denied. You know, this the laws from the Republic of Texas are still good laws, are still valid, and the precedents from the Supreme Court of Texas and the Republic are still valid precedents. Have you had Jim Paulson for any classes? So he teaches here. He's actually an officer of the Republic of Texas. No, he's not that old, but what? <laughs> but but it's actually a good story. So the Supreme Court of Texas, the current one, wants to publish some decisions from the old court, right? That had been published before. So he was appointed as the reporter of the Republic Supreme Court of Texas to report the decisions. So he actually has a commission on his wall that says, I am an officer of the Republic of Texas. That's kind of cool. I don't know. I, I like that. I'll give one better. So he, he, he's a nerd like me. He gave me a spike from the Erie Railroad. I have it in my office. Want to come see? I'll show it to you. Right? It's an actual spike. From the, I think it's not unless he made it up, but he told me it's from the Erie Railroad. I have no way of verifying it. Um, anyway, so move on. <laughs> um, all right. So the Texas law is actually fairly progressive. Um, we'll do divorce stuff later, but it's actually a fairly advanced law. Oh, another point. Um, you'll study in constitutional law, I think at least you probably will, a case called Bradville v. Illinois, 1873. You can check now. I think I'm right. Um, in Bradwell, the Supreme Court considered whether a woman could be denied entry to the bar. And one of the reasons why women were denied entry to the bar was because if they were married, they could not form a contract. And an attorney-client relationship is a contract. So the fact of giving women contractual rights open up an entire range of um, work opportunities. You don't think of how significant it was. It wasn't just women. Freed slaves could not make contracts either. They couldn't write wills. They couldn't give evidence. They couldn't testify on juries. Right? There was an entire sphere of rights that you maybe take for granted that were denied to people that make you basically a full citizen. Anyway, some history for you. Uh, you'll do more of this in constitutional law, I think at least. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Any questions so far? I may have to. Mike, you know, you've been patiently waiting for like 30 minutes. All right, Mike, go to page 429, please. And there's a question. Just read out loud. Yeah. The wife, yeah. What do you think he did? <laughs> Keep reading. Yeah. going all right my friend what do you think and the wife enforces contract um i mean it kind of reminds me of like, this thing that you were just saying about opting out and basically uh, saying that well it wasn't a will no this was a contract during life this was not a will you're not opting out. actually it's a good point you raised this is not opting out the will this was a contract during life inter vivos can can she get the court to basically um, enforce the contract? That's that's the question. Can they enforce the contract, which means you set aside the conveyance of the daughter? What do you think? It's a hard question, I think. Maybe not. I don't know. No, I mean, uh, which way do you think the courts come out here? And Katsi, you're on deck. I yeah. Think <laughs> Why do you say that? Why do you say that? All right. Well, it's, it, as I'm reading it, when they say when he died, he divides the property funds to the wife. Correct. To his daughter. So that means he changed his mind, basically. He did. Or, or he lied to the wife up front. We don't, we don't know. Maybe he never intended to give it to her. He just told us that they, so she would take care of him. Right? Pe pe people lie. I think you all agree with this. People lie, especially to their advantage, right? That's especially why you lie. When it, we can, when oh, lovely wife, if you take care of me, I'll give you everything. And he dies. He gives all to the daughter. What's your position here, sir? I don't think. Okay, now the harder question is: Why will the court not enforce this contract? Uh, because, like, if I'm assuming that he is his wife, 
she is his That's wife. correct. He already had that property because they didn't have. But he agreed to give it to her. She took care of him. It's a, it's a valid contract. There's, con, you know, it's consideration. It's, it's, you know, this formation. All the, uh, all the elements are present. Right, but then once he, I guess, reneged on that, that, but that's a breach, right? In other words, the, she's asking for basically specific performance would force the contract. That, that's what she's asking for. It was a breach. Correct. So, so will the court enforce the contract? That's the question. Should the court enforce it? Maybe it's a better question. I guess phrasing it like that because it's like two different things. One is a will, one is a contract. But Should this be an enforceable contract, Mike? That's that's the question. Give me a yes or no. I, I, I'm vacillating between the two. I can tell you're really conflicted there. So give me an Just say yes or no. Give me an answer and I'll move on. Say yes. Man. Yes? Okay. okay. Katia, what, what, what's your opinion? I've, I've given you five minutes to think about it, right? What's your answer? Okay, that's good. That's good. You're all listening to each other. That's that's why I like to hear. Um, well, right, but the the contract was inter vivos, right? So think of the painting giving to the son, right? The contract was given during life. In theory, that preceded the will, so it would trump the will. Mm -hmm. And the question is whether you can enforce. Basically, forget the will. The husband breached the contract, right, by writing the will, and now she wants specific performance to give it uh, to give it to the wife, not to the girl. You enforce this contract. Well, but let me ask you this question differently. Does a spouse have an obligation to care for their partner independent of a written contract? No, I mean, Ooh. Morally, yeah, but so so if if there's this moral obligation, because it's something you can contract around. Can, could you? And I used this example earlier. Just you're gonna hate me in a minute, but could you write a contract with a spouse? That says, if you divorce me, you pay a million dollars in liquidated damages. Could you do that? You're going to hate this next week more. Could you do a contract in which you contract having sex a certain number of times a week with a spouse? So the question is this, right? What exactly is marriage? Look, these clauses exist, right? Google Jackie Onassis clause, right? Um, and, uh, later, right? I, 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 got, I, I, got, I, I said it. It's there. It's on YouTube. Go. I got to go. What exactly is marriage? Right? What, what marriage? What is marriage? Is this some sort of lifelong commitment to another person, or is this just like a arm's length contract you form with someone else for you know valuable consideration for a ring on your finger? Right? What 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 exactly is this marriage? I'll tell you what the court did here, and then maybe you might like it or not. The court did not enforce the contract. How many of you? I, I don't know, Paul. You actually better not to. Right? The court did not enforce the contract, but why? The court said. There's a marital duty of support. By virtue of getting married, you obligate yourself to enforce, I'm sorry, to support your spouse. To enforce a contract about marital relations would violate public policy. That this was basically almost a, a contract of servitude and you can't force your wife. I mean, this is basically saying you have to do this and if you don't, you don't get something, right? The court says we're not gonna enforce this. And the court says to enforce the contract would degrade the wife Making her a servant at home, merely taking care of the husband for wages or, or, or the comp or, you know, future compensation. One second. The court said this this arrangement was antithetical to the institution of marriage. Ooh. I'll give you the there's a dissent. I'll give you the dissent in a, in a minute. Clark? I, was, I guess if, 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 well, I would understand that if the wife had come to the court when the husband first offered the contract or something like that and said, you know, this is. But she up. wanted the contract, though. She no, heard, she wanted this contract to be enforced. I understand. I, I, so she already performed it. Like, oh, we're degrading her by enforcing the contract. It's like she's already been degraded. She had to take care of her husband. And, he, and she wanted to. She did this with the expectation she would get the property. So who's degrading whom? Uh, Maddie, is your hand up? I'll tell you something. And any divorce will know this. Until you divorce, you're not divorced. Separation. Doesn't mean anything. Uh, it it, it has, has no legal significance. I mean, it technically does because in some states to get divorced, you have to actually live not under the same roof, but it, it, it ain't over till it's over. Uh, Daniel, what do you think? It is. But this was marriage, a property from a prior marriage. This wasn't the wife's joint property. Someone asked the same question earlier. This is from a prior marriage. There's a dissent, right? The dissent said this was this contract, uh, sorry, the court's opinion was based on an outmoded view of relationships. 
And here's the important point. The, the, the wife could have chose to put him in a home and kept working and building her own career and doing other things for herself. But instead, she undertook the responsibility to take care of him by herself. And the court and the dissenter said, there's no obligation of a wife to take care of her husband. There's freedom of contract. So effectively, the, wife, the, the court said, if the wife wants to work as a, as, a, as a nurse or a housekeeper, she can do that. And he would enforce the contract. Hmm. Anyone want to think? Anyone want to add anything? This is a 1993 case, so about 30 something years ago. Andres. Yeah, yeah, until death to us part is, yes, right? Look, look, I mean, look, I'm not going to make this point facetious. Is the marital vow an enforceable contract? Absolutely not, for the reason of the majority. I mean, if you really took the marital vow seriously, if, if a husband had a cold and the wife's like, I'm going to Vegas for the weekend, right? Can you sue for breach? I mean, under under a no-fault divorce regime, you can. Right, That's the modern rule. You can get divorced for any reason, no reason at all. But a common law, that was not enough for a breach of the uh, marital vows. There was a case in family law where um, a husband and wife are at the altar. The husband says, I do, and he drops dead immediately. And this, I think this might be in your book. I can't remember. And then the the the, the, the wife's family tries to say, oh, they're married. The, the husband had, the, the, the minister hadn't officiated. He'd say, okay, now pronounce what he said, I do, and he dropped. And the question is, was there now marital property? Were they now division of assets? And so the vows actually do make a difference. Is it is a formation, right? Is there is it what what the final act to make a contract? My goodness, right? I'm having flashbacks to one L. Well, you, no. It is sad. It is sad. Mike, want to want to add something? Well, just a question about that. I thought that, that guys, guys, let me talk, please. Thank I thought you. that. Marriage, kind of like how back in the day when they transferred grass or whatever, yeah. a symbol. I thought that that's more so like the ceremony is just a symbol, and you have to get the contract to. Symbol. Well, look, you're in the state of Texas, my friend. You ever heard of common law marriage? In so so this one you got to know. Uh, Texas is the easiest state in the country to get married in. We have common law marriage, which a lot of states have. Even <laughs> I'm going to try. I'm going to get the standard wrong, but. If you hold yourself out as married, even if you don't intend to, and other people understand you as married, that's good enough. So if you're with another person for 20 or 30 years in Texas, you never got married, and then some court later says, oh yeah, you were common law married, guess what? All community property, no prenup. Was that say who? Yeah. Marissa? That pay for your job. So that means to also co-inhabit for like one night in Texas. Claim habit for what? Don't you have to co-inhabit for one night? In the example I get, they live together for three decades. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Dead. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know if that was a rule in that state. I, 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 it might be, and I, I'm not sure this one night rule. That sounds a little dirty, right? But um, I, I, uh, I. <laughs> you guys are getting me in trouble. Um. All right. Here. So that means that I cannot have a prenup, Texas. Of course you can. Oh, okay. You can have a common law. <laughs> Look. Look, you can have a common law prenup. You can do whatever you want, right? You can have an arrangement, but there's a risk that it might not be enforceable. Uh, you'll do this next semester, right? Prenups are not, they're often not enforceable for a lot of reasons. Look, I, I, guys, you gotta raise your hand. Trey, last comment, I'm moving on. Yeah, I was just trying to figure out how this works if it's a uh, community property that they, you know, not a, not a property from a prior uh, you know, marriage and just community property between the husband. We'll do that next week. Okay. Thank you. Can we move on? Let's move on. All right. I want to move on to the Sawada case. I think it's actually a, it's actually one of my favorite cases in the book. I really like this case. The facts are good. The parties are interesting. Right? There's chicanery going on. I like this case. All right. Um, let me give you a, a, a legal question. And I think uh, Daniela, right over here. Um, let's say that you know you hit someone with a car, right? And you have no car insurance, and uh, the only asset you have is a house. You have Black Acre. And then you know you're hit with a huge damage, right? You, you injure these people. And then you go and sell, right? You go, you go and sell your property to your sister, right? For the total value of $1. Wink, wink, nod, nod. And then like you keep living there. You don't move. And your sister's holding this house in her name for a year or two. Eventually the case settles. The court says this person's judgment proof. You know, there's no, nothing to do, right? Then your sister comes back and says, hey, sis. One dollar. Want, want this property? So, yeah, I'll take Black Acre. What have you just done? Yeah, what's a fraudulent conveyance? Could 
Correct, right? You convey an asset for the purpose of avoiding a judgment against you. That's illegal. And one more, Danielle, what does the court do if they find you fraudulently convey Blackacre? What can the court actually do? Exactly, it's called set aside, right? Reverse or set aside, you'll see both phrases in the, in the, in the text. The court can set aside the fraudulent convey and say, look, this transaction to our sister was bogus. This was not an arm's length transaction. This was designed to simply frustrate her creditors. Now, that's the, that's the question that we have here, right, in the Sawada case. Uh, oh, you flipped it so quickly. I was, I, hope I, was, I was trying to see it, and I missed it. It happens like instant. No, it's very impressive. Like, so, Angelica, let me ask this question, please. I was, I was actually saying, let me turn around so I can flip the card. I missed it. Uh, you want me the facts, please, in Sawada? Um, yeah, so Thank you. <laughs> The, the husband was driving. Okay, go on. Right, right. Well, what did the, after they hit them in the car, they had no car insurance, what did the husband and wife do in advance of this lawsuit you know, going forward? They didn't just try. They did. Is there any evidence of consideration the sons paid? Did the, did the family move out? Did the kids, did the sons move in? Okay, so let's just be real for a minute. Why did the parents give the property to their kids? Um, basically for a fraudulent demand. So they wouldn't have the creditors go after Okay. Well, All right, good. So the, the question in this case is, was the conveyance of the sons fraudulent conveyance? But that's actually a very hard question. Because it's based on, an other, on another question. Could the creditors have seized Blackacre? Right? Could the creditors, the, the other couple, have seized Blackacre? If the creditors could have seized Blackacre, then the conveyance was fraudulent. If the creditors could not convey Blackacre, then there was no fraud. Right? Again, let's say that one more time. If the creditors could have seized Blackacre at the time, then the conveyance was fraudulent. If the creditors could not have seized Blackacre, there's no fraud and the court can do nothing. So the question becomes entirely, can creditors seize a tenancy by the entirety where only one spouse is at fault, right? This was a separate debt, the husband's debt for the tort, right? Can the, 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 the plaintiffs here seize Blackacre, a tenancy by the entirety, to satisfy the husband's separate debt. The wife wasn't behind the wheel, right? She had no role in the tort. Maybe she did, I, we don't know, but I'm assuming she had no role in the tort. The husband was a tort feeser. Can you take the property away from both of them, given that only one of them was in liability? And this was a question of first impression for the state Supreme Court of Hawaii. The court hadn't decided this yet. And the court sort of surveyed or did a you know, study of other states and what they've done. And very helpfully, they divided the states up into four categories, which are, I think are, are, are somewhat helpful, but somewhat not helpful. But we'll go through them one at a time, All right? These four states, or these four groups of states, handled the Married Women's Property Act differently. All right, so uh, Sarah, help us out here. The first um, category of states only has a handful, I think three states in it. What, what's the deal in group one? So group one, they followed the old Yeah, and you see what it says, it's the old English common law, right? And Hawaii is a common law state, right? So this is, again, a common law rule in a common law marital property regime. I said again, right? Uh, uh, this was Massachusetts, Michigan, North Carolina, right? Massachusetts followed the common law rule with a common law marital property system. It makes your head spin, but just know the difference. All right, go on in group one, please, Sarah. Yeah, so first, the um, husband and the exclusive division of the property, they could have seized it. Correct. In these three states, again, these states later changed their policy, right? But in these three states, even after the Married Women's Property Act, the husband retained complete re control. And the rule is if you can control something, your creditors can seize that. Whatever you can control, your creditors can seize. So in Massachusetts, was it Michigan and North Carolina? The husband controlled the tenancy by the entirety. Therefore, the husband 
the husband's creditors could seize the tenancy by the entirety. Right? So I'll just do question number two. And I'll do this one for you because it's easy, right? Husband, wife, or H and W or husband, wife. You're welcome. Uh, they own, I give this one out, it's not obvious, right? They own Black Acre as tenants by the entirety. Husband falls into debt. C asked the, the C is the creditor. C asked the court to seize H's interest in Black Acre. Question Could a court in group one seize husband's interest? The answer is yes, right? So the answer is just to keep your notes straight. In group one, the creditors could have seized the assets of the husband. If the Sawadas lived in group one at this time, the conveyance would have been fraudulent because the husbands could have, the, the creditors could have seized the asset. Yeah. With me. The, group one's, I think, is the easiest one. The reason why it's somewhat easy is because no state does this anymore, right? Every state subsequently abandoned, um, subsequently abandoned this common law, uh, this common law rule. All right. Everybody with me? All right. Bless you. Group two is a little bit trickier, right? Uh, 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 Kimmy, right? Kim. K. Oh, so close. I didn't see your name tag. I, I got K. It, oh, you're you're Kimmy, right? Oh, come on. That's that's you're like in the same line of sight. Ugh. It's okay. I'm 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 getting there. I promise. Before finals, I know your names. I, I feel a, a deficit. All right. So I was at Texas a Law School yesterday. I was giving a talk and. I swear, I'm not getting stuff. The professors, they can't require masks in the classroom. But they actually penalize students who go unmasked. So they're actually are giving students negative participation scores if they don't wear a mask. I swear, I couldn't believe when they told me this. And they're giving students passes and recitation if they wear their masks. So if, so the entire school. Anyway, so I, 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 I just mentioned this because like I'm seeing faces here. I was at a and yesterday. I didn't see faces. So anyway, go on. So, okay. Um, let, me, let me, I think they're probably violating state law also. State law probably doesn't allow that. But anyway, go on. Um, let me ask this question. Um, in group two, could, this is question 2B, right? In group number two, could the creditor seize the husband's assets? Tell me why. Okay. That's correct. Group two, and, and just tell us which states are in group two, please. Yeah, Alaska, Arkansas, New Jersey, New York, and Oregon. Random, right? Like, there's no like geographical like continuity here. There's gonna, New York and New Jersey, right border, but the other ones are like, why? But at least in these states, the the, the group two states. A tenancy by the entirety could be used to satisfy the wife's separate debts. Right? What does that mean? If the husband has a debt, say in a tort judgment, the creditor seizes the husband's interest in the tenancy by the entirety. If the wife has a debt, the creditor seizes the wife's interest. Now, actually, let me ask what this means, right? The husband and wife are living on Black Acre, they're tenants by the entirety, everything's beautiful, and the husband has a judgment against him. And the creditor seizes the husband the husband's interest. Does the bank move in on the farm, <laughs> right? Does the bank live with the couple? No. So what does it actually mean that the bank takes the husband's interest? They're not evicting the husband, right? So what actually, what, what valuable thing is the husband getting here? Um, sorry, can you repeat that? What valuable thing does the bank get in the group number two? Because they can't kick the husband out. They can't sell black because the wife's still there. What valuable thing are they getting? Oh, do they get the right of survivorship? Correct. And what does that mean, right? They get the husband's right of survivorship. What does that mean? That means that the wife dies first and the bank gets the estate. Exactly. Right. So this is kind of messed up, right? Bank what? Banks never die. Banks never die. No, no, that's for that. I, I actually made that point this morning. Banks are forever. They don't die. People die. Banks don't. Or I guess banks go bank under, but you know, generally they don't. Maybe Russian banks don't. Banks, <laughs> too soon. Right. Uh, what the bank's actually getting with his judgment in group number two is the right of survivorship of the husband, which means if the wife dies first, the bank gets it in fee simple. If the wife dies first, the bank gets it in fee simple. But actually, what happens if the husband dies first? 
Does the husband does the bank get anything? No. Right. If the if the husband dies first, the debtor, bank gets nothing. So you see the risk, right? You're basically hoping the wife dies first. I know that's morbid, right? But you're just waiting and say, hey, how you feeling? You, you're yeah. coughing a little bit. You look a little thin, right? Uh, look, I, I'm not telling you with life estates, you wait for someone to die. That's what you do. Right? I know that sounds awful, but again, if you love someone, say with fee simple. Right? But with these sort of life interests, you're waiting for someone to die. Um, there are a lot of kids who are waiting for their parents to die. I don't want to make this point too much, but it's their advantage. What's that movie, Knives Out? Right? You know, uh, yeah, that was a good movie, actually. I like that one. Who done it, right? Everyone has the motive to kill the father. Okay. Oh yes, my. Is it about killing parents? I hope not. Correct. Um, through right of survivorship. Right, they're, they're getting the. I mean, say it this way, right? The bank is getting the husband's present and future interest. That would be one of saying, right? In, in group number two, the bank is getting the husband's present and future interest. They can't do anything about the present interest. They can't evict the wife. And, and this is like my, my fair question to Ashley. The bank's not going to move in and just, you know, just go into the bunk beds, right? That's not going to happen. They're not going to send like a teller to live with them, right? That's not how it works. They're waiting for the wife to die. Now, this is risky. Is that your hand? Yeah. I'm going to Please. They can't actually do Nothing until the wife dies. That's also why. Can't, you're done. You're toast. They are waiting for the wife to die. That's it. That's the entire ballgame. Alexa. If the wife dies first, the bank takes it by virtue of survivorship. That's right. Now, this is a reason why if you're in a group number two state, no bank will give you a loan unless your spouse signs off. All right? Just think about that for a second. If you're in a group number two state, really any state, but especially group number two state, if you want a loan, they're going to make the wife sign off. Because they know they don't want to sit around and wait for Ma to die, right? That's just not a good business model. They want to be able to seize the asset immediately, put it up for auction. That works for contract and loans, but not for a tort, right? With a tort, there's no way in advance to know who's going to hit you in a car, right? That's just impossible. You can't know who's going to give you a, 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 an injury. So that rationale works for group two with the uh, tort damages. I'm sorry, contra uh, uh, contractual obligations, but not tort damages. All right, I'm going to get, yes, uh, Jason. So if the husband dies before the wife, then the bank permanently loses. Bank will never get a penny. Line. Yeah, it's risky, right? There's a huge risk. Daniel, and then Rieger, and then Anwar. In actuality, do the banks usually try to sell that interest off? I mean, They'll so auction it. Unless the bank thinks it's an investment property, they usually sell it for auction. Uh, Anwar, your hand up? So the bank doesn't have a right of survivorship? Well, they do, hoping the wife dies first. But right? If the husband dies first, the right of survivorship is extinguished. They have the, the bank had the husband's right of survivorship. No. It, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a live state property review if you think of it that way. It's yeah. a duration of the husband. It's not the bank's, the bank lives forever, right? It's a duration of the, of the husband's life. So again, you're waiting to see who dies first. And that can make a huge difference. Don't ask when they die at the same time. Please don't ask that question. I, I'm, done with, I'm never going to that question in this class. All right, go on. Well, it's a weird thing because doesn't this sever the unities by having a new person on property? It does, which is why it's all fiction, right? It's sort of a fiction. In, in every sense, having a bank in the relationship severs, uh, severs unities. So it's this weird, fancy by the entirety and waiting to see who dies first. It just, it, I mean, the upshot is it won't last forever. It might be however many years that husband or wife dies, but it makes a very weird sort of like squeaky here. It makes a very weird transition period where you don't know what's what. That's fine. Like, no. I don't understand your question. Like, if the you know the bank's obviously waiting for the husband to die first. A fraudulent right. suicide to ensure yeah. the wife. That's a good question. I. So you're saying if the husband takes his life to ensure the wife gets it? A fraudulent suicide. I've never considered such a thing. I. I mean, suicide. It's. I mean, well, suicide can't be a crime because it's. If you complete the act, there's no means of punishment. Attempted suicide is. What you would probably do is charge wife with conspiracy to commit suicide, which or attempted suicide, which could be a crime in most states. So I think you'd actually go after the wife, and you could probably say she has unclean hands. And, and, and yeah, I mean, if the husband and wife discuss, all right, honey, you'll take your life. I'll get the house. And the wife was part of that conspiracy. I think you could go after the wife. 
that's my guess. I I can't imagine it's ever happened, but uh, you, you know. Yeah, okay, crazy brain. We got it. We got a three fifteen. Yeah. <laughs> Any other crazy brain questions? All right, that's group number two. Uh, Trisha, I think you're up next. What's group number three, please? So could the husband in group, I'm sorry, the creditor in group three seize the assets? Correct. One more question for you. Maybe maybe more than one question. Why did the group three states reach this rationale? What was like their their, their thinking, their, their policy rationales? Thanks for the estate or home. Uh, just like most insurance look at it as if the protected asset is right. where you go. Right. It's basically this inseverable asset, right? It's meant for the family to have together, that this is something they share, they raise their, their kids there, this is something that's very important to them. And, and there's like a dozen states, and DC, DC is not a state, but there are, do, there are about 10 states and the District of Columbia that are in group three. And in this jurisdiction, the creditors cannot reach the land held by the husband and wife. The creditors cannot reach the land held by the husband and wife. At least one court in Maryland said that allowing a creditor to seize a tenancy by the entirety would convert it to a tenancy in common. This was whose question a minute ago? Uh, no, Andres, right? If you have someone else there, doesn't that sever the unities, right? Doesn't this render it a tenancy in common? I think this part of the group three jurisdiction, I think, makes sense. If you have literally another person holding the interest, you're down the ladder, you're tenancy in common. And then if it's a tenancy in common, that's not a tenancy by the entirety. So the court would say, we don't allow this to seize it. We don't have to break up the marital asset. As a consequence, if you're in group three and your husband, your your spouse with the tenancy by the entirety, live it up, right? Because they can't take your house. They can garnish your wages, maybe, but you know they're not going to take your house. So it, it really is an absolute, basically, shield against marital assets, which are tenancy by the entirety. The husband can live it up, or the wife too. So she can live it up and not fear it. But again. Um, if you're in jurisdiction number three and you're a bank, you're going to want both signatures on the page, right? Both husband and wife to consent to the transaction. You're not going to risk this stupid thing where, oh, we're together, right? But with a tort, with a tort where it's not anticipated, you don't have that control. Yes, sir, Kate. Uh, so in the group three states, if both of the spouses are living it up, let's say then creditors go up to property then if both of them have debts? <sighs> Well, it's actually a careful question. Is it marital debt or is it two separate piles of debt? If there's two separate piles of debt, the answer is no, you cannot go after them. You can only go after them for joint debt, you know, like a mortgage, for example. Uh, yes, Renee. Um, so the first one was old English common law. Do these next two have? Not really. I mean, these are all these are all common law states. You notice California's not on the list. You notice they're about 40, they total. California's not on the list, Texas on the list, because rules in community property are different. These are all common law states, but group one reflects the common law approach to common law marital property. And groups two, three, and four are, you're going to hate me, the modern approaches to common law property. You're welcome. I'm sorry. I know that was painful. I hate doing this, but it's, you got to separate it out for your notes. All right. Uh, who's up next? I don't see a name tag. Oh, you do the flip thing. Yeah. Grant. Grant number two. Oh, Grant number two. Oh, my goodness. You guys are... Grant, what's group number four? Group number four is the weird one. Right, so group four is just uh, Kentucky and Tennessee. Yeah, I, I lived in Kentucky, so I mean, it's a good state. A com a commonwealth, actually. There, there are four commonwealths. It's Massachusetts, right, Virginia, uh, 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 Kentucky. Oh, my God, the other one. Oh, man, I, I feel failing. Anyway, three of them. I've lived in three of them. Go on. Oh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is the fourth one. I've lived in all of them. Yeah, except for Massachusetts. Go on. So group four... Uh, says that it is uh, alienable and can be attached during, the, and during the marriage. However, uh, creditors can only seize the Robinson partnership. They can't go after it. Can the they seize the, the present interest in Blackacre? Yeah. No, sir. Right. So in this way, two and four are kind of similar, right? In two, you get both the present and future interest. In four, you get only the future interest, the survivorship right. So during the life of the husband and wife, the bank gets nothing. And again, the bank is hoping, praying, if you will. Banks pray, maybe, I don't know. The bank's praying that the wife dies first, in which case the husband's survivorship right kicks in and the bank takes over the house. But if the wife outlives the husband, the bank gets nothing. So again, there's risk here. 
in all three of these are the risk, right? Basically, only in one, in two, only in option one is it the bank just makes that clean. In the other three options, the bank has either a partial victory or no victory at all. And again, group number one doesn't exist anymore. The states, they, they change their laws. So in every state now, every common law state, if a husband and wife use a tenancy by the entirety, they're going to shield their assets from collection. Yeah, Kevin. No. Yeah, no. The, I mean, technically, I think the bank, right, technically, I think to sell the property, you need the bank's permission. Because I think the bank could probably consent to the sale because they have the future interest. If the couple sold on their own, they're basically giving someone a period of time until one of them dies. It's not a very long period, right? It's like selling a life estate. Who wants to sell a life estate? Because you're going to lose it soon. You could probably lease it. Lease sold would make more sense, I suppose. Yes, Andres. Uh, I suppose you can partition a joint tenancy, but that would basically sever the unities, which makes it tenancy in common. So, yes. Both parties just have to agree. Well, you can do partition voluntarily or partition by court order. But why would the, um, why would the bank agree to it? Well, I don't want to. Why would the wife agree with it? They don't want to. Maybe. So yeah. Yeah. Fuck. Sorry. Uh, there's a little like bed of like 20 states. What are the other 30 doing? Uh, um, so, two things. So, some of them are com community property states like Texas, right? So, about eight of those. And if I had to guess back in the 80s when this case was decided, the other states hadn't, hadn't resolved the issue yet. Right? Not every state had made a decision. Hawaii, for example, had never had to resolve this issue. I'm guessing they hadn't actually decided yet. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't I don't know what they what the count is. I haven't checked. Daniel. Might be Andres' question re asked, but if the bank holds the right to sign that one of the parties, um can then the remaining spouse destroy that uh tenancy in the entirety and create a tenancy in common securing uh, no but his interest he has no present interest. The the, 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 the debtor spouse can't do anything. No, the the, the spouse is not the debtor. By conveying it to someone else? Yeah. Oh, I see your question. So let's say the wife says, screw this, I'm divorcing this guy, and she moves out, and that creates a tenancy by in common. That would secure the interest of life. That 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 I think that would actually kill the bank's um survivorship right, which is why the court might set it aside as a fraudulent conveyance. This is sort of like Carmen's question about suicide, right? The courts are very sensitive when people randomly engage in transactions to defeat a court's judgment. That's, so I think a leasehold might be the best you can hope for. No, in other words, no one's going to buy that property knowing that it can be set aside later as fraudulent, right? Why would you risk it? Unless you're a criminal, maybe criminals do it, or you commit fraud. You don't, you don't tell the person this history, and they do it anyway, and then you can get it set aside on those grounds. There's a dissent. Dylan, what's the dissent say here? There's a dissent. Yes, there was. To be honest, I did read it. I just had a hard time to understand the dissent. I don't have time. Vanessa, what's the dissent say? Um, it said that they would follow the New Jersey rule. Number two, yeah. right? Group number two. Why, why did the dissent go with number two? Yep. Yeah. And so what's the consequence of getting equal rights? What do you also get? Well, equal rights and you have separation, right? Yeah, equal burdens. Equal burdens. That's the rule, right, from the dissent. Women, welcome, you're equal. You want the benefits, take the burdens, right? You can't just take one. Because in group number three, right, women get these awesome rights of control, but then their family skates out of collecting on debt. So if you want to be able to have your own protection, you also be able to have, to have the debts. So in group number three, if the husband collects debts, the husband can be seized. Or if the wife collects debts, her desk can be seized, right? They can't live it up, so to speak, right? They, they can go after it. That's for group two, I, I think I misspoke. And that's why in group two, the dissent would have favored it. With equality, or with great power comes great responsibility or, or something like that. Uh, something like that. All right. Any questions on the dissent?
So also, actually, the hand was up and down, up and down. You make me lose my mind. I, sorry. You done? Okay. Yeah. Uh, other questions on the Swada case? So I like this case. It's a good case. It's actually clear, right? It, it lays things out in a pretty, I think, cogent fashion. All right. A few more points. I'll let you guys. Again, my other class finished at like 10, 12, whatever reason you guys go longer, which is good, right? But the other class is quieter. And they are. I, I can't explain it. Maybe it's in the morning, the traffic, they're quiet. And you guys are ramped up, all caffeinated. Uh, I don't know. Um, in almost every state, as you can tell, the tenancy by the entirety is protected against state courts. But the feds have different rules. So if you owe taxes to our beloved IRS, April 15th is coming up in two weeks. Your I haven't done mine yet. I'm slacking. Right? But you have two weeks. If you owe tax to the feds, they can seize your tenancy by the entirety, even in a state that doesn't permit it. Um, so don't fall back on your taxes to the feds. The feds can reach the tenancy by the entirety. Uh, bankruptcy. Um, bankruptcy is federal as well. But generally, property owned by tenants by the entirety are exempt from bankruptcy creditors. Right? Generally, not always. But if you have a homestead as a tenancy by the entirety, your creditors cannot seize that in bankruptcy. It's designed to keep the family together. All right. That's all I have. Questions? Yes, Monet. Right. Sorry. Yeah, let me go back to it. With bankruptcy, generally, property owned by tenants by the entirety are exempt from bankruptcy creditors. They're exempt. So you can't seize the homestead. Make sense? All right. Any other questions? No? Have a wonderful weekend. I will see you all Tuesday. Thank you. Okay.